Hello, everyone, and welcome back for our fourth Celebrate Henrietta Lack Centennial Conversation. I'm Shiria Thompson, and I'm honored to be back with the Lacks family as we continue our collaboration to honor 100 years of impact, celebrating the life and legacy of Henrietta Lacks. Our mission, as you may know, is to preserve the life and legacy of Henrietta Lacks by educating future generations on how her cells have continued to impact the world, but also to make sure that people recognize that she was a wife, a mother, a friend, and a dynamic woman who lived and walked this earth and we are using that story to actually reclaim the narrative, reclaim the science, and make sure that we are empowering our communities to promote health equity and social justice. You may have seen that the Lax family have gone teal. Uh, Hilo 100 has started and launched our teal takeover this November because the Lax family is teaming up with the World Health Organization to proudly work to end and eliminate cervical cancer. Today, you're going to learn more about how it's possible to do this right now. Uh, we know that there are breakthroughs that have taken place because of Henrietta Lacks' cells, and we want to make sure that all of the advances are made available to all women and girls, no matter where you live and no matter what you look like. If you'd like to learn more about how we are teaming up, visit Hilo100.org, which as you can see has gone teal. And there you'll find more resources on how the Lax family is fighting against cervical cancer, tools that they've created to share with you on how you can get on social media and tell your story, how you can support women and girls around the world, and how you can actually learn and team up with the World Health Organization in your own community as well. If you'd like to learn more, visit Hilo100.org and Cervical Cancer. Today, we're proud to continue in partnership with this series to make sure that we can bring experts to you and to have important conversations. So we invite you to start thinking of those questions because we've got an incredible lineup where we'll be learning more from Dr. Nono, who is the Special Advisor to the Director General Strategic Programmatic Priorities at the World Health Organization. And she'll be sitting down with Alfred Lax Carter, who's the grandson of Henrietta Lax and the president and founder of the Henrietta Lax House of Healing. If you're on Zoom, welcome. If this is your first time coming to one of our Centennial Conversations, feel free to submit your questions in the chat or in the Q&A function. If you are joining us on Facebook, welcome. And we know many of the Lax family actually tune in to the Facebook Live uh, series. So if you are a Lax family member, welcome back. And if you have questions for them or for Dr. Nono or Alfred, feel free to include those on Facebook. We also know that many of you are watching on YouTube. And if you have closed caption needs, please feel free to watch on demand and follow us on YouTube where that service is provided. We also encourage you to subscribe because each month we will have a new conversation and you won't have an opportunity to miss any if you're subscribed. So we want to make sure that you can join our conversation. To do that, you can actually submit the questions uh, in the chat box as we talked about, but if you're having any technical difficulties, feel free to email us at impact at Hilo100.org. So again, I am honored to have Dr. Nono sit down with Alfred. We had a chance to initially talk about the work that she's been leading with the World Health Organization. Uh, but if you wanna talk about a true warrior of the light who's been leading work and committed her entire career in life um, to making sure that women and girls, no matter what you look like, no matter what your background is, has access, um, it's incredible. So thank you again, Dr. Nono for joining us. And we're gonna go ahead and get started with the Centennial Conversation. So, Dr. Nono, on behalf of myself and the Lax family, we just wanted to um, let you know that we are very, very um, gracious and happy to be working with yourself and Dr. Parham and the WHO. Um, as a family, um, we do many things to try to um, have Henrietta Lax's, uh, her legacy live on. Um, so we want to ask you, um, what do you do to celebrate Henrietta Lacks? Thank you very much, Alfred, and thanks uh, to the Lacks family 
for inviting us or for and, and allowing us to be a part of this very important um, initiative and movement, as it were. Um, the, the fact that we finally were able to come together, I think, is already a big celebration for us. It comes on the heels of the adoption of a global strategy for the elimination of cervical cancer. This is a huge milestone because this is the very first time that the global community has committed itself to eliminating a cancer. And for this to be cervical cancer, which is the first such cancer to be eliminated or will be the first, is a great honor. So being part of the Lex family is an incredible opportunity and the first time that we commit to walking this journey with you, uh, being part of the work that you do in our own way. And because we are a member state led organization, which means member states um, determine what we do, it is a big deal because 194 member states of the WHO said yes to this strategy. There are strategies that have been rejected by this big assembly before. And we are proud that for this strategy that we put in front of them, they adopted it with an enormous consensus. So this, you know, to us, this is a great moment. And the fact that on the day of the launch, we will be celebrating the lives of the women who have survived and who are proud to tell the world about their own journey, inspiring other women to follow suit and to take care of their health and advocating for governments to give access or provide the tools that are required, because we do have those tools, but they are not accessible to everybody. I agree. Um, a lot of people, um, there's a lot of health disparities around the world, um, and people don't have access and don't have the tools. And, um, and I agree, it's a great, it's a great thing um, with what you all are doing and with the WHO. WHO is doing to eradicate um, cervical cancer. Um, I, I know that myself, um, a lot of people aren't aware of what HPV is. So could you um, explain to us what HPV is and how have Henrietta Lacks cells impacted HPV? HPV stands for the human papilloma virus. It's a virus. It's one of many viruses, but this specific one has different types. So there are over 100 types of HPV, but amongst these, there are high-risk ones. So we often say, and it's probably true, that it's the most common sexual infection amongst women. But most women clear the infection out and they don't get ill. But there are the types of HPV, which we call high risk. And if infection persists with the high risk uh, types of HPV, uh, then the women get start to get sores on their cervix. And if these are not picked up and removed, then they are in, inevitably going to get invasive cancer, which probably in this day and age, unfortunately, will lead to their premature preventable death. Now, where Henrietta Lacks comes in as an incredible contribution to science is that we know that cells were taken and extracted from her body when in fact she was ill due to cervical cancer and they were used for the advancement of 
science in a myriad of ways. You know, it's contributed to knowledge about polio, how to develop the polio vaccine. It's contributed to knowledge about how to develop the HPV vaccine that is currently being used, but not accessible to every young girl who needs it and many other advances in science. So the world has a lot to thank her for, and it should be a celebration that is held globally, uh, you know, if you consider this contribution. Um, as people often write, those who are authors and those who have researched much more than us, that, you know, the contribution Henrietta has made, um, it's probably the biggest ever. So we, we should um, talk more about this. We should educate people because these days, all people know is we want the HPV vaccine, but they don't have a clue how we arrived at this point. So we will take that on as WHO to work with the knowledge in a way that brings up the, the person behind this innovation. That is why we are going to be bringing women who have survived to be the ones that speak on the day of the launch and not have these experts you know, who, who speak. Experts are okay, but we want the women who have lived uh, and experienced this pain and have survived. Wow, that's 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 wonderful. Um, you know, just you know, the my grandmother's name, Henrietta Lacks, being synonymous to the word global, um, it's profound. It, it's a great thing. Um, so, how did you become a um, you know uh, advocate for you know cervical cancer? Wow, you ask a very deep and personal <laughs> question, but I will answer, answer, Fred. I, as you know, I, I come from South Africa. So I was born in a country where we were oppressed because of our color. Um, it's also a very patriarchal uh, society with a lot of sexism. And I fell in love with being a doctor from a very young age. And this was driven by a small, a small incident where I saw a white doctor examining a group of old, older black people from under a tree. He had his stethoscope on, but he didn't have it in his ears. And he kept asking the patients to breathe in and out. And I was looking at this person and I thought, he's playing with our people. And I was still in high school. When I saw this, I thought, I decided, no, I want to be a doctor. But I am a passionate, uh, I'm passionate about women's health, particularly. So when I finished my junior degree, I had a very inspiring mentor who was an obstetrician. And I just said to him, I want to be like you. So he said, well, you have to study another four years. I said, I'll do it. So I did. So that's what inspired me. And I had incredible parents, you know, who loved knowledge, who loved um, young people to, to, to thirst for knowledge. So they encouraged me a lot. And that's how I came into this profession. And my whole life has been about women's health women's health and now with all the scientific knowledge you are gaining i'm now focusing also as much as i can when i can in this job on adolescence you know because i really believe if we bring up young girls who are well and healthy then we have already um, invested in their well-being oh that's that's great you know um being you know such a uh inspiration um to other young girls of color um 
I just think in this, I think it's phenomenal uh, the work that you're doing, um, and you're truly an angel. And and you know I appreciate everything you do. Um, so um, I would like to know, you know, what are cervical cancer disparities, and why do they exist? Well, the disparities, you know, they they make you angry actually when you look at them. And that's one of the things um, to his credit and honor that our director general uh, acknowledged when he put out this call for action. He said, you know, the world has the tools and the knowledge, but we are not applying this knowledge. So the inequities are really, they strike you when you actually look at um, maps of the world because you see that in high income countries, they have a low incidence, low rates of cervical cancer. But even in those high income countries, you've got pockets of marginalized groups, vulnerable women who obviously don't have access to care. In, in the States, we have the same. In many of these high income countries, now with a lot of migration, of people across borders, you also see that uh, migrant women do not have the same access. So that's first and foremost. So they, they are done with a, a lot of this work because they've got the vaccine, which we don't have. And that is a sad reality that we must really, really advocate and ask the question, why is it that countries that hardly ever see lots of women with cervical cancer, be, why must they be the first ones to access the vaccine? You know, why don't you concentrate on lower and low middle income countries where you know the burden is already there? It's a triple burden. The girls don't have the vaccine, the women are already infected, and many of these women are dying. So you see those disparities, Sub-Saharan Africa hard hit, some parts of, of South Asia. Now in countries where women are dying are the low and middle income countries. And it's a question of inequity because the, the costs of the vaccine is very, very high. The diagnostic tools that we've had in Africa are bulky, and they're not really compatible with our clinics because often we don't have electricity, often we don't have trained practitioners, very few oncologists, you know. That is why when you meet and find someone like Professor Parham, you, you grab him and you hold on to that expertise and you deploy him across many countries. Um, so that's what's creating the inequities. The fact that we really have to push for, you know, the prices to come down for those countries that need this vaccine the most, and for the tools that we already have in the world to be made available at a reasonable cost for countries that are poor. Wow. So this is what we highlight in the strategy. Oh, wow. You know, it, it, it sounds like these inequities and these disparities are like globally, like it's everywhere. Um, so can you share with us um, your strategy to eliminate, you know, eradicate this cervical cancer? Like, like, you know, what is your personal feelings on the strategy to do this? My personal feeling is I know it's a tough road, but it's doable. You know, you, you've got to reach young girls before they turn 15 and they are in school. If they are not in school, you've got to find a way to reach them. So, I, you know, they, there's no reason why we cannot get to them, except for the fact that we don't have the vaccine. Women come into the clinics and we don't have to wait for them. You know, when they are not well, they will come in. Even before they get ill, 
we can be in the communities. You know, women speak to other women. You know, the, the, the advocates from Lusaka, for instance, if you think 120,000 women, you know, talking to each other about this. So once you've, you've given communities the right information about what is important, you know, we teach and, you know, not teach in a, in a way that, you know, creates a barrier or in a way that disrespects women. We give them the information they need. They themselves will come into the system and seek those services and be the advocates for it. And I believe that with this power of women, we can get to the elimination. Because if, according to our targets in the strategy, 90% of girls are vaccinated, 70% of women at the right age are screened, and those found to have a, a problem treated, 90% of them, and those that have advanced cancer, unfortunately, receive the high quality care that is due to them so that they don't die, you know, painful, undignified deaths, which many of them do. So I feel it's going to be a hard slog, but we've got te technology now. We can take a picture with a, with a smartphone or with an ordinary phone that's got a, a camera, you know, so at least with the upcoming technology, I'm extremely hopeful that we can do this. And our message to governments is, when you invest in treatment for cancer, many other people with cancer benefit. There isn't, you know, specific, specifically designed machines. There are for women, uh, in fact, a small part of the machine that can be put inside the woman's body as close to where the cancer is. But otherwise, you can use that technology to do other things for other patients as well. So it's an investment, and we have done the numbers in WHO to show that it's a worthy investment. It's a best buy. It makes sense to invest in this. So I think, you know, by creating this social movement, by getting women really to stand out there and demand these treatments from their governments, we will succeed. And to get through to them, to the politicians that you know, this is not a cost, it's an investment. Investment indeed, and a, a um, very, very important investment. Um, you know, our women and our children, um, and when you said, you know, the technology, um, that's a great thing because, you know, as I understand, and, and I'm pretty sure that you're aware that, you know, my grandmother Henrietta um, when she was going through her treatment with the radium, um, it was really barbaric um, the way they were treating her, um, you know, sewing radium right on her cervix, um, burning her from the inside out. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't want no one else to um, ever have to go through um, such torture and pain like that. So it's a great thing, um, you know, the technology that, you know, they've come up with. Um, as a man um, and supporting the women in my family, um, my wife, um, my sister, um, you know, my, my transitional housing program, um, we always hold um, women health seminars to educate not only women, but also men on women's health. So as men, what can we do to continue to support women and you know try to eradicate the cervical cancer? What what can we do as men? Oh, there's so much that men can do. I think already what you're doing in your program is a huge contribution. I think the most important thing is to give men this information that we have shared today, explain to them what all of this means and other issues that affect women, that women are not always comfortable to talk about. And then for men to 
support their partners as they seek care. You know, we, we, you don't walk away just because um, your partner is ill or your wife is, is unwell or, you know, some in some of the countries where we've worked, where, where some of this convers these conversations are taboo, uh, women say, tell us that, you know, it's so hard because then, you know, I can't be intimate because it's very painful but I can't get my partner to understand. And then they get you know, beaten up and things like that. So I think bringing women, men into the conversation early as boys that they understand you know, and remove the taboo around this. There, there was a myth going around you know, that says, you know, if you taught um, adolescents um, comprehensive sexual education, that promotes them, you know, to to just go on and just have unprotected sex. Then it, this was proven to not be true. That little young girls who had the information had the power to protect themselves. They knew that to say no, it means no, and they knew what not to do. So we should make sure that there is age-specific information for these young girls and boys, and continue that tradition of conversations in the home about these issues and things that um, people don't want to talk about. Because families that do that, you, you find there is less gender-based violence or intimate part of partner violence. The children grow up comfortable in the knowledge that they can come to their parents, their aunties, their whoever is a relative to talk about things, then they don't get information on Dr. Google and everybody else. And they know that they can come home to be supported. So be a great dad like you are. Influence your friends that don't understand and explain to them. Um, continue the work you are doing, you know, reach out to men um, in very difficult uh, circumstances men in prisons like you're doing now, helping with rehabilitation, men who work, you know, if I use South Africa, for instance, in the mines, you know, men who work in, in work or jobs that emasculate them, as it were, you know, that make them feel small, you know, um, that take away their dignity. Uh, those are the men that we need to reach with this information. So I think you're doing a great job. In fact, my question to you was, how can we take the work you are doing um, to get more men engaged in this? I was really, you know, very surprised and honored to listen, you know, to you talking about what you do because it gave me hope, you know, that this, the whole issue about how we relate as men and women, there is an opportunity to reach a point where things can be better. So, you know, what inspired you to do what you are doing? Well, thank you for those kind words and I really appreciate it. And that's great advice um, that you just gave. Um, and, and I encourage men to be kind, um, caring, um, understanding and basically educate themselves on um, the women's anatomy um, so they can like, so to speak, put, put ourselves in your shoes. Mm -hmm. So we know where you're coming from, from your perspective. Um, what would encourage me to do my type of work is um, I know for a fact that there's a lot of men who are in prison that you know, they don't have um, a support system um, while they're there and they don't have a support system when they when they come out and that leads to recidivism. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I was blessed enough to have family and friends to support me um, in my time of need. So to pay homage to my grandmother, I created the Henrietta Lacks House of Healing and that way men can come to the house 
and they have the support system that they might not have from their family because, you know, people might have passed away during their time of incarceration or they may have burnt bridges um, and people, you know, their family just not dealing with them anymore. There's many aspects of why mm -hmm. men don't have support systems when they come home from prison. Um, so it just it just made me feel um, alive and and I just felt proud like when guys come out and, you know, they come through my program and um, they get jobs and they get their own place and they now they, you know, they get married and they have children and they're supporting their family. Mm -hmm. And it's just a fulfilling um, um, term of endearment. Um, it's just something that makes me feel good. Um, and that's what I was saying to Dr. Parham um, on our last conversation that, you know, if I could be half the man that he is, I'll be happy because that... <laughs> That man is a great man, and, and he's doing wonderful things. Yeah. Yes, yes, ma'am. Good in the go. <laughs> Thanks. So, so in your in your field, um, like, what are some of the biggest challenge challenges that you face, and what can people that are listening right now, what can they do to help? I think you know there are there are many challenges, but if we approach them systematically and we have networks and partnerships like we have now with you, and this, this is, is more than a partnership, it's, 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 it's a family relationship now. But getting, you know, like I, the most important thing is for people to educate themselves. If you have an opportunity to get information, go out and get it. Understand what is happening in your community advocate for access you know let's let's deal with these inequities by making sure women whether they're in the minority or they're women of color or however they they need they are being described that everybody must have access let's talk to the to the medical fraternity as well because there are many women who go in for care or to be screened and they get turned away for whatever reason. So we've got to also speak to the doctors and the nurses who are doing all this work. And more importantly, we've got to face the politicians. We really have to get those public private partnerships where we can get the tools at reasonable rates. I'm sure they've already made, I can't even quantify how much profit people make. And you can't, you can't morally do that and watch people in another part of the world just die like flies, you know, and, and feel okay about this. This is a point that, you know, has to be pushed through. There, there is a vaccine, but the vaccine is accessible to those who can afford it and where the, the disease is the lowest. You know, so this is something that I think we need to be open about and ask everyone in the global community, the health community, women's advocates, church communities to speak out about this inequity. And let's really take the, tackle this head on to ensure that people don't die just because they live in poor countries when their death could have been prevented. So this is what I, I really would like the world to take on. And um, unpreventable death is, is unacceptable. You know, when we can save a life, let's do that. When we say it's okay for you to die because you've got no money, then we've lost our humanity, you know? And, you know, I look now at this pandemic and I say, well, when there is a problem, the world can come together and very happy to be on this planet and see people uh, working together to deal with this pandemic. But the same tools that are being applied now are the very tools we need for cervical cancer. So when God help us, this whole problem goes down, don't switch off the taps, keep them flowing because we need those very 
uh, laboratories uh, to test the women. You know, don't, you know, just say it's all over now, uh, we can pack and go home. Use what you've spent trillions to procure to now carry on and establish good health systems for people uh, when they need care. So there is a lot, um, Alfred, that we can continue to advocate for, to make sure that if we can get every young girl less than 15 years of age vaccinated, we can be sure, as sure as both of us are talking to each other now, that there, there will be no cervical cancer 20 years from now. And that can be, you know, a legacy on top of a legacy, you know? Yeah. And that will have Henrietta's name on it, for sure. It has to, it has to. I agree, I agree. Um, just to know that, you know, the possibilities are endless right now to eradicate cervical cancer um, is a very fulfilling um, thing. Um, and whatever myself and my family can do to help in any kind of way, um, I'm here. Um, I'll advocate, I'll, I'll, I'll go out, I'll be the boots on the ground, to, I'll go to schools and, and let young girls know that Henrietta Lacks is my grandmother and, and, and we'll teach them and we'll educate them and we'll let them know that, listen, you need this and this is going to help you um, and it's going to help people behind you. And, and, you know, so it's just a wonderful thing. Um, you know, our family is so honored um, to have, you know, such powerful people as yourself, um, you know, recognizing um, the impact that our grandmother has on, you know, hum humanity. Um, can you tell us um, how you are honoring Henrietta Lacks during the centennial, sorry, the centennial celebration year? Ah, I think, you know, ever since Richard and I spoke about making a huge effort to find anybody who could link us to you or any member of your family, when he came back and said, yes, we can do this, I've managed to find someone and they are willing to speak to you. That was the beginning of a bigger celebration for me, you know, um, because there's, there's, there's so many uh, similarities in our lives, not just Henrietta's, even your sisters and your cousins and every woman of color that for me, you know, it meant, it means that I can't stop. I, I can't take a day off from this work because if I do, I miss one day of honoring her legacy. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a celebration from now on, you know, because I know that if we push and push hard enough, even if one extra woman gets screened and gets treated, it's one more life saved, one more life saved. And if that is all one can do with one's life, that's big enough. That's big enough. So I'm, you know, carrying her in my heart. And I promised Rich that I, I'm not gonna let go of this star. You know, it's always easy to be tired, but it's an inspiration, you know. So my celebration is going to be an internal and external fight. I think I will be bolder than what I ever believed I could be because it really makes me angry. Makes me very angry, Alfred, that we can't get access to the vaccine for poor countries. It makes me extremely angry. So I'm going to celebrate, fight, agitate, and make sure that young girls and women get the treatment they need. That way, this year becomes the beginning for me of the second phase of my journey in my life for women's health. 
So that's how I will celebrate. And my biggest celebration for today and many other days is having met you and your lovely family and being embraced uh, as you have embraced us. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. You're so, so kind and wonderful and very humble. Um, so um, what would you like to end our conversation with today? How would you like to close? I would like to first, you know, like I've said, thank you very much. Just acknowledge, you know, the, the big impact and the big soul that Henrietta was and continues to be. And to say to your listeners, anybody who's going to see this, there are so many injustices out there. This one in particular is one that all of us should take on. So I would like to encourage people, if you don't know about cervical cancer, educate yourself. If you don't know anything about the HPV vaccine, learn about it and learn more about this incredible woman behind this incredible scientific uh, discovery. And then be a kind person, a person that embraces others, a person that shows people where to go uh, if they need care, not just for cervical cancer, but for many other problems that people have. But, you know, let's all make sure that we teach one and make sure that person teaches another one. So we are a world of people full of knowledge, knowledge that will help not just ourselves to maintain our health, but that we can transmit to the next generation so that when they think about us, they celebrate like you are celebrating, like we have joined you to celebrate Henrietta's life. Wow. So, so profound and, and so articulate on a layman's terms, like, like you, like when you convey to me your thoughts and your feelings, um, about, you know, things in the medical world and cervical cancer, you know, you talk to me in a way that I can understand it. And I appreciate that. And I respect that from you because a lot of times, um, and this is the problem with patient and doctor, um, relationships, you know, when, when women go to hospitals, um, they are already, um, in distress. Um, and you know, the doctors come in there with, you know, forms like thick as a book and sign this, sign that, and they talking to you people, um, and they're talking over their heads and in, in language that people can't understand. Um, so I, I just thank you for that. And you made it very clear. Um, and on, behalf of myself and the Lax family, you know, we want to thank you for taking the time out to have this conversation um, about cervical cancer and how we're going to eradicate this thing. Um, I look forward to working with you all. Um, I look forward to seeing you in the very near future. And I just want you to know that you have my full support, 100%. And like I told you before, this is not a working relationship. This is a family relationship now. You're part of the Lax family. Oh, so thank you. You're welcome. So from now on, you know, you're family to me. And like I said, I look forward to working with you again. And if you ever need me, you, um, you can call me, get in touch with me. Um, Sharia, she has my um, contact inf information and you're very much welcome to it. And I thank you and I appreciate you. Have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Alfred. Thank you so much to you and your family and to all the beautiful people that I met recently. This is a journey we will travel together. If I slip and fall, I know there will be people behind uh, who can pick us up. 
That's right. Not so pick you, you up. Not pick you up. I'm gonna catch you. I'm gonna catch you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Much You're appreciated. Thank God bless. God. Thank you everyone so much. That was an incredible conversation. And we are excited that Alfred has joined us and Dr. Nono for your live QA. And today is also Alfred's birthday. So happy birthday, Alfred. I know that he's on travel, but he wanted to be here with you and sit down and open up your first question. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and put your screens up. Um, so if you'd like to share your cameras and if you are on Facebook, feel free to submit your questions in the chat. If you are on uh, Zoom, feel free to share them um, in the Q&A section. Hello. Hi, Alfred. So we did get a question through um, direct message on our social media platform. And somebody, um, this would be for you, Dr. Nono, in ways that people could understand. They asked, what should women do or know when it comes to symptoms about, around cervical cancer? Thank you very much for that question. Um, the challenge with cervical cancer is at the beginning, we probably will not pick up any symptoms. Then you will start experiencing, you know, discharge, vaginal discharge. It could be, you know, different color. It could be smelly. You might start experiencing lower abdominal pains. And that then is, is very, very problematic because it probably means that um, the cancer is growing and in infecting other organs in your body. So I would recommend that uh, women go in regularly uh, to be checked, uh, do your annual check, but we recommend, as I, we've said in the strategy, that women should at least uh, make sure that they are screened you know, by age 35 and with a very good test so that it's easy to pick up those changes. We, you can also experience um, bleeding after intercourse, because at that point you might be having um, growths or you know, uh, ulcers on the cervix. Uh, so if you're spotting in between your period, if you have um, low abdominal pain or you start having uh, uh, unusual smelly vaginal discharge, please go in for a checkup. Thank you. That's really great. I think a lot of people are wondering, um, but can you explain a bit on what you said? You said, but the best thing you have to do is really make sure you get those screenings because you can have no symptoms or go a long time um, without symptoms, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, one other question along those lines is kind of how has COVID-19 um, impacted women getting these screenings or um, is this something that they should make sure they continue doing during um, different regulations and lockdown? We have seen uh, that the pandemic has had a negative impact not only on screening, but on most services in a, number, in a good number of countries, even you know, the well-resourced countries because of the lockdown, people couldn't move around. Uh, we are encouraging countries to put the services back in place. Uh, and we know that particularly for women, screening had really been suspended, you know, because as I said, usually uh, people don't have a symptom. And we have also encouraged governments to ensure that um, women who have already been diagnosed, they're not, their surgery is not postponed because then the longer you wait, the more advanced uh, the cancer becomes. So we've seen a, a negative impact, obviously, and we are now working through our institution with all the member states, WHO is putting out 
guidance to countries to please restore the services, all the services that are critical. And we believe screening for cervical cancer is a critical uh, intervention. Thank you so much. And I guess this question kind of goes um, along. We're getting some of these in private message, and I think it's due to the nature of the conversation, right? Um, because maybe women have questions or their partners may have a question that is kind of hard to opt ask in the open. Um, but outside of the vaccine, is there any way to protect yourself from the HPV or um, human papillomavirus um, or condoms that would work for it? Uh, the vaccine is probably our best shot, but we do encourage uh, young girls who are sexually active to have uh, protected sex. Um, it will also help uh, for young boys as well. Uh, to be, if you, they are being uh, sexually active, to really uh, protect themselves. It, was, it would help not just for um, infection with HPV, it helps also with HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. Uh, outside of that, I think just good health care and really being conscious, I think, uh, of your body and being alive and looking and questioning, you know, things that are happening that are not normal for you uh, to seek care uh, or to find someone, you know, that you trust that you can speak to and make sure that um, your questions are answered properly. And at least, uh, as I said, you get someone to examine and look uh, whether there is anything going on or not. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have some people on Facebook wishing Alfred a happy birthday as well. Alfred, we have a question for you. Um, they, you spoke a bit about how men can be involved and they just wanted you to talk a little bit more um, if you can share. Yes, good afternoon. Um, good, good afternoon, Dr. Princess No No. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, Alfred, and happy birthday. <laughs> thank you, thank you, it's a pleasure. Uh, I just wanna say thank you um, to everybody, uh, all the birthday wishes, um, thank you so much. Um, to answer your question, Felicia, um, uh, what men can do uh, as far as cervical cancer is basically standing behind women and educating themselves on cervical cancer. That way they can be of help to a female and um, just be there, um, encourage the females. Uh, and also, like I said, I have women's seminars uh, at the Henrietta Lacks house. So I encourage all men um, to come out. And plus um, we want um, everybody to know boys can also get the HPV vaccine as Dr. Nono stated a little while ago. Um, so it's not just for young girls, it's for young boys also. Great, thank you so much, Alfred, for sharing. Um, I know we have some more people. Let me just check the chat and see if there were any more that came in. And then I know everyone has a busy schedule today, so I'm not gonna hold you too much longer. If anybody has any other questions, they can always be sure to give them to us on Facebook or reach out on Twitter. Oh, here's another question that came from Emma asking, how can young people, specifically college students, spread awareness around cervical cancer and honor Henrietta's legacy? Great question, Emma, thank you. Is that for myself or Dr. Yeah. No, no, that's for Dr. No, no. I would, I would love for you both to answer um, because I think everyone <laughs> spreads awareness and raises awareness in their own um, avenues and honors Henrietta mm -hmm. to see the same. So I'll start with Dr. No, no. Um, how can college students spread awareness and honor Henrietta's legacy? First and foremost, I think people need to make sure they know um, they understand and that they have the information. 
The challenge I think always is with medical terminology, you need people to help you translate it into very simple, um, very simple ways of communicating, but that's not impossible. It's been done before and we can continue. So college students are a, a critical uh, group and they are a captured audience as it were, because they are on the same campus, they talk to each other. You know, you just need one or two of them who are strong, who know what they're talking about to start a group um, that then has these conversations about women's health, about the, you know, how, how the body works and what they need to do if they see anything that is abnormal. And as, as um, Alfred said, these conversations are not just uh, for girls, boys, men, they must come into this conversation to start demystifying and making discussions around sexuality something normal, you know, then young people will not be ashamed and they will be more empowered with information. So college students get the information. I would even say that um, even that the, the people who teach them, teachers, professors, anybody who's supporting students on campus must make it a responsibility to know something uh, about the, the work of Henrietta Lex first and foremost, and her contribution, and to ensure that they have someone on campus who can respond to questions and issues that uh, the students themselves raise. I'm sure those things are in place, but they've got to keep adding information, updating it, and making sure that they put a day aside, for instance, to talk about health, to talk about sexuality, to talk about partnerships and relationships. These things are very important. Thank you so much. And Alfred, okay, what, please. Uh, yes, um, you know, in my opinion, what college students can do to, um, you know, continue on the legacy of Henrietta Lacks is just basically um, each one teach one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, keep the conversation about Henrietta Lacks uh, going um, because there's so many people who don't know who mm -hmm. Henrietta Lacks is as a woman, as a mother, as a wife. Um, and not only that, they're not aware of the contributions that she's made to this world. So mm -hmm. if you know who Henrietta Lacks is and the things that she's done for this world and all the countless lives that she saved, um, just educate somebody else um, mm -hmm. because we all need to know who this powerful black woman is. Uh, and it's just something that um, we all need to do. Um, just get the word out. Uh, have you ever heard of Henrietta Lacks? Do you know who he is? I go to the hospital sometimes and some doctors and some nurses don't know who Henrietta Lacks is. And when I tell them who she is, they're just, they're, they're astonished. And they say, I've never heard of her before. So just um, pass the word on and let's uh, educate the goal on who Henrietta Lacks is. That's great, thank you so much. And um, just around those awareness components, I think as Dr. Nono said earlier, um, they do recommend that you get the HPV vaccine up to the age of 26. So college students can also um, possibly take action on themselves and make sure that they're doing everything, whether it was getting vaccinated um, at a younger age or even um, during your college years. So I'm gonna move along. Um, I really wanna thank everyone for joining us here for the Q&A portion of the Centennial Conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Princess Nathumba Somela. I want to say your name right. And thank you so much, Alfred, for joining us. I think you had a very moving conversation. If anyone missed parts of this conversation, you are free to check it um, online on Facebook, as well as on YouTube. And there were portions shared across Twitter as well. Um, don't forget to join us November 17th from 7 to 8 p.m. We will be in the Baltimore City Hall Dome lighting it up teal as the world goes teal for the elimination, the launch 
of the strategy to eliminate cervical cancer. You can join um, WHO online as well as the rest of the world in their 194 member states as everyone joins together to raise awareness and launch the strategy. Certain people will be doing screenings around the world as well. It's going to be an amazing event and you can find more information on that at gila100.org slash in cervical cancer. And it will link all to WHO's website and you can find all about the actual strategy to eliminate cervical cancer as well on WHO's website, which we've shared. All right. Thank you. Each month for Thank our you so much. People to check back each month for our centennial conversations. In December, we will be sharing um, our next conversation. And thank you for watching. And if you're watching on YouTube, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you, Dr. Nono. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you, everybody, for your time today. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to our team and we'd be happy to assist you in connecting with Dr. Nono or the team with Alfred. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Feloshi. Thanks, Alfred. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, I have Bye. one thing to say. I have one yeah. thing to say. I just want to say I, I was watching the news the other day and I saw that President-elect Joe Biden is going to continue, well, he's going to um, partner again with the WHO, and that's a very exciting thing. Very so exciting. We're grateful. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Alfred. Thank you so you're, much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. We'll see you on the 17th. Thank you. Thank you very much.